Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Dennis Hirsch, um, and I'm a professor of law at the Moritz College of Law. Uh, and more importantly for this event, I'm the faculty director of Moritz's program on data and governance. As we all know, uh, data and information technologies can produce many benefits for us, but they can also create significant threats to privacy, to autonomy, to fairness, and to other important rights and values. And the question on one level is how to maximize these, maximize these benefits and reduce the risks. And that is a question of governance. And that's the question in which, on which our program, the Program on Data and Governance, focuses. Uh, the Program on Data and Governance is part of the Translational Data Analytics Institute at Ohio State. That's kind of a broader initiative at Ohio State that focuses on data analytics. Uh, and PDG, as we call it, the Program on Data and Governance, has a two-part mission. Uh, first, we conduct research on the threats from information technologies and data and on the governance approaches that will allow us to reduce and we hope eliminate those threats. And second, we try to engage the community in a conversation about data and information technologies and how we want to live with them in our society. Um, so we try to raise the most significant and difficult and interesting issues and bring in leading thinkers to discuss and sometimes debate them and so enable us to see our way forward just a little bit more clearly. And we do this in a number of ways in a number of different fora, including through our Data Points lecture series uh, in which you are participating or you are an audience member today. Today, our society faces a particularly significant data and information technology issue. We are faced with a pandemic that has killed tens of thousands of our fellow Americans and many more throughout the world. And some of the solutions to this public health crisis, such as contact tracing, can require us to give up a good deal of our privacy. So what is the nature of this trade-off? And do we want to make it? And are there any alternatives? These are the questions that our panel of experts will be talking about today. Now, we could not initiate these conversations for you without partners. And in particular, we could not do it without the sponsor of the Data Point Lecture Series, the law firm of Porter Wright, Morris and Arthur. And we thank Porter Wright for its vision in understanding the importance of these data governance issues and for supporting this lecture series in order to enhance all of our understanding of these issues. So thank you, Porter Wright, for your generous support of the Data Points Lecture Series. It's now my privilege to introduce you to the moderator of today's event, Professor Brian Choi, who will in turn uh, further introduce the topic uh, and also the panelists. Uh, Brian is a assistant professor at both the Moritz College of Law at Ohio State and at Ohio State's Department of Computer Science and Engineering. He is one of those few scholars who can bring together the worlds of technology and of law, and so is a perfect moderator for this event. And I'm very delighted to be able to, uh, to introduce him and turn this now over to Professor Brian Choi. Well, thanks, Dennis. Um, I'm delighted to welcome, to moderate this panel and to welcome this distinguished panel of experts. Um, I will start, uh, just introduce the topic, um, uh, introduce the speakers, uh, and then go to questions um, and then Q&A from the audience. Uh, just as a matter of uh, logistics, I, I did want to uh, inform the audience that we've disabled the chat function, but we do welcome your questions through this Q&A feature, um, and we'll be uh, you know, cycling through some of those questions towards the end of the session. Uh, so the topic is uh, data privacy in the time of pandemic, well, how your phone may or may not be able to help, the, uh, help fight this pandemic, what that would mean for your privacy. Um, you may have heard about uh, efforts to do contract tracing through your cell phone data um, and 
you know, some, you know, how does this affect our uh, data privacy interests? Um, is this an effective trade-off? Uh, and um, all those questions uh, are, are, you know, maybe uh, surfacing on, and how, you know, how should we think about those concerns? So we've gathered um, a, a distinguished panel of experts. Um, let me introduce them briefly in turn. Um, we are, you should be able to see their uh, full speaker bios in the chat window. There's a link that um, uh, uh, our program manager has, has pasted uh, into that chat window. Uh, but let me uh, briefly uh, introduce each of our uh, panelists. So first is Jennifer Lee, who is the Technology and Liberty Manager at the ACLU of Washington, where she's been working on a range of surveillance and biometric technology policies at the state and local levels, including uh, topics such as facial recognition, data privacy, and AI-based automated decision systems. Our second panelist is Michelle Richardson, who is with the Center for Democracy and Technology, or CDT, uh, where she is the director of the Privacy and Data Project. Her advocacy focuses on user privacy and social justice issues, and she also has extensive experience working on surveillance and anti-terrorism issues. Uh, she's also serving as a senior fellow at George Washington University's Center for Cyber and Homeland Security. Third uh, is Brian Ray, uh, who's a professor uh, at the Cleveland Marshall College of Law. He's the Alan Miles and Betty Willis Rubin Professor of Law. And he's also the co-founder and director of the Center for Cybersecurity and Privacy Protection. He also serves on the Cyber Ohio Advisory Board, the Ohio Attorney General Facial Recognition Task Force, and the Ohio Law Enforcement Gateway Advisory Board, among many other roles. Uh, and finally, Stacey Gray is senior counsel at the Future Privacy Forum, where she focuses on issues of data collection in online and mobile platforms, ad tech, and the Internet of Things. She's published uh, um, white papers on craft device tracking, as well as on smart home technologies that are always on and always listening. So let me, uh, so with that introduction, let me ask Jen to kick off the discussion um, uh, and tell us a little bit about an overview of the privacy and surveillance concerns that might be arising out of this COVID-19 situation. What are some of the key things we should be thinking about as we consider how to balance privacy and public health during this public health crisis? Thanks so much, Brian. And uh, thank you everyone for being here today. Um, at the ACLU of Washington, we've been closely monitoring threats to privacy and civil liberties. And we recognize that even in the midst of truly extraordinary circumstances like this pandemic, fundamental privacy rights and civil liberties can and must be protected. While the COVID-19 virus is definitely a grave public health risk, and special measures to combat this disease are definitely warranted. As we continue to evaluate technological and data collection-based proposals, such as tech-assisted contact tracing tools or immunity certificates, we need to be thinking about key ways in which we can safeguard both privacy and public health. And I'll share five key principles that we should have in mind as we navigate this pandemic. First, privacy is absolutely compatible with public health. And in fact, Voluntary and privacy-friendly public health measures can often be more beneficial to public health goals than privacy-invasive and coercive tools that collect far more information than is actually necessary to perform the public health-related function of stemming the pandemic. Tools that collect our information without adequate privacy protections can be used to invade our privacy, deter our rights to free speech and association, and target and discriminate against certain individuals or groups. Public health experts have found that coercive health tactics frequently backfire, leading people to mistrust and resist such tactics, which may actually have the effect of undermining public health goals. For any tool to work effectively, people need to be able to trust that any tool will not be used to harm them. And um, this means that uh, tools must not be used for criminal or immigration enforcement and use of the tool must not be a condition to access things like employment or other basic necessities. Making tools both privacy friendly and voluntary will have the effect of both safeguarding civil liberties and advancing our collective goal of stemming the pandemic. Second, surveillance technologies are not a panacea to stemming the COVID-19 pandemic and should not replace or divert critical resources from testing and treatment. We're seeing an increase in technological proposals to target the pandemic, including things like drones, thermal cameras, and exposure notification tools. And while these different proposals vary in their uh, levels of efficacy and privacy friendliness, 
every technological proposal is predicated on the assumption that there will be widespread, accurate, and equitable testing. And without these measures, technological solutions can actually be counterproductive by diverting, measure, uh, by diverting resources from proven measures. Um, if you get a notification from an app letting you know that you have potentially been exposed to the virus, but you can't get tested and you can't take measures like self-isolation because you can't afford to do so, the presence of an app won't help you solve the core issue at hand. Third, privacy intrusions have to be necessary and proportionate. Any program that collects personally identifiable data about people have to be rooted in science and public health and must be proportionate to the need. For example, we know that COVID-19 has a two-week incubation period, so it would be disproportionate to collect location histories of people for 10 years. Any tech-assisted contact tracing tool or data collection policy deployed must be able to justify for what purposes data are being collected, for how long data will be retained, and must continuously be reviewed in order to ensure that any privacy intrusions continue to be necessary and proportionate as the situation with COVID-19 um, continues to evolve. Fourth, we should be wary of companies using COVID-19 as an opportunity to market their products, further legitimize surveillance infrastructures, and create future opportunities to make profit. As we increasingly rely on technologies to work, access education, and connect with our loved ones, we're likely exposing ourselves to greater and greater privacy harms. Sensitive health data are being accessed by surveillance tech companies and mobile app developers. And as students increasingly learn from home, tech companies have been providing free remote learning tools, which of course should be appreciated, but we should also be thinking about the privacy trade-offs that may come with using these products. And if students, parents, and teachers really have a meaningful opportunity to consent to giving away their data. Lastly, we need an exit plan. We've learned from crises of the past that data surveillance tools we build to handle emergencies often outlive the crises they intended to address. We saw after 9-11 the creation of invasive surveillance programs, one of which was NYPD's program that lasted over a decade and used powerful automated license plate readers, or ALPRs, to religiously profile and spy on Muslims. The program was ultimately struck down as illegal, but that doesn't take away the, the harms that were already inflicted on this community. We want to make sure that any surveillance tool built for the purpose of fighting this pandemic will be terminated once this pandemic ends. So to recap, one, privacy and public health are compatible goals. Two, surveillance is not a cure-all to stemming this pandemic. Three, any tool that is used must be rooted in science and must be necessary and proportionate to the need at hand. Fourth, we need to be skeptically scrutinizing new products and proposals for their impacts on privacy and civil liberties. And lastly, we need to have a plan to terminate any surveillance tools built for this pandemic after it ends. So with that, I'll turn it back to Brian. Wonderful. That's such a, a, a great summary of the discussions that have been um, you know, happening about these privacy uh, concerns. Uh, so let me turn things over towards uh, to Michelle. Um, maybe you can tell us some about the kinds of um, protective measures that you, we might be able to, to engage in, some best practices, some of your own uh, experience uh, dealing with these kinds of surveillance, um, uh, you know, technologies that have that have come up in these kinds of emergency situations. Sure. Thank you, Brian. So it's going to be incredibly important for either companies or governments to think really holistically about what the threats are here, how the data could be misused, and over time, the type of fallout we could see if this data isn't very carefully collected, used, and then destroyed eventually. Um, I think one of the things we've learned over the last couple of years is that we need to look at data and the people that it reflects in context, right? There's no single data set out there that doesn't interact with others, that doesn't reveal something sensitive about all of us, and that can't change hands instantaneously, cheaply, right, um, and unaccountably once it gets out on the open web. So there are real consequences down line um, if we are not careful on the front end about how we choose to do these programs. Um, in general, the types of programs we're seeing um, are often about trying to figure out who is sick or who might be sick next, right, and there are things like um, 
location tracking or movement tracking, right? Maybe not an individual, but um, where people are going and whether people are able to self-quarantine, like we've been asked. Um, we've also seen a lot about actual contact tracing and interactions, and I know we'll talk about that more, um, to see if we are able to track the spread. Um, and that is evolving now, especially as we talk about returning to work and school. Um, are there going to be ways in those institutions to be able to track it, even if people are not um, downloading publicly available commercial facing um, apps to their phones. Um, and then there's symptom trackers and other things that um, are really more directed at individuals to empower them and ultimately second secondary uses of technology that are now facilitating learning, working, grocery shopping, right? Everything we have to do now in a very different way. Um, all of these are able to collect information on us right? Um, some of them, it's very clear on its face that you are interacting with the tool and you are choosing to put in your symptoms, for example, um, and get this, the information back about whether you should see a doctor or stay home. But some of this could be happening quietly in the background. Um, it is concerning more when you think about um, the websites you visit, data brokers, other people out there in the ecosystem who could be making inferences about whether you're sick or likely to get sick um, and sharing that information with people who could use it to disadvantage you. Um, ultimately, there are a few best practices here though, um, no matter where you are in the system. Um, one is a voluntariness. Um, I think Jennifer mentioned this. Um, this is tricky though, I think, Again, if we step back and do big picture and be realistic about um, how technology is going to be used by people and companies and governments, right? Um, there's just a huge power imbalance. People need to go back to work, they need to go to school, um, and it's gonna be very hard to opt out and impossible for a lot of people who don't have that option. Um, data should usually be used in the aggregate or de-identified form. Um, there are very important insights that companies are already gathering just from looking at uh, community or neighborhood data, um, showing where people are not able to self-quarantine, for example, the locations that people are traveling to, and it allows a little more sophistication um, when fashioning the response, whether it's corporate or from the government. Um, these tools need to be inclusive. You know, if you ever find yourself saying something like, well, we can't serve everyone, go back to the beginning, start over, right? The point isn't that uh, these tools have to serve everyone, it's that they always fail the same people over and over again for the same exact reasons, right? We can foresee this, we know who is most likely to get sick and why um, and have trouble accessing resources and all of that needs to be built in, right? Um, it's so funny, these, these tools are usually, um, framed as collecting data that's going to bring new insights, we really need to start using the insights we already have, right? So this is incredibly predictable and it should be used to build tools that are better and more inclusive. Um, we need accuracy too. I think this is one that is still um, a big question mark. It has been hard to suss out the value of these sorts of um, tracking apps, especially the contact tracing. Um, they have been employed in some countries, but they were part of bigger programs too with, you know, um, mandatory quarantines, um, lots of testing, mask wearing, things that um, we're not always doing here in the US, right? And it's hard to measure the value of the actual app. Um, and finally, uh, transparency and accountability. Um, to the extent that um, the average person will be able to understand a little bit at least about how the data is collected and used, we need that up front. Um, this is very difficult in a country where we don't have a baseline privacy law, right? Most of these big companies that if you're interacting through an app or online um, aren't subject to really explicit privacy and security rules. They are overseen by the FTC or maybe in California or Nevada for some minimal rights, um, but there aren't clear bright lines about what you can and can't do with data, um, especially health data, which is sensitive. Um, ultimately, we're hoping that we see the best practice of purpose limitations to emerge. It takes the stress off of all the other things we talked about, right? If the data is just collected and used for what someone actually signed up for, you are meeting individual expectations, not surprising anyone, and actually serving the public interest and public health interests. So some of, those are some of the um, things we are hoping to see as these tools develop. Um, I will say it is incredibly difficult to keep up with them. Uh, you know, they are coming out constantly and as much as we are talking about things like 
Bluetooth contract tracing, right? We're seeing states go further already, uh, companies trying to come up with different solutions. And so um, we're gonna have to keep talking about this as these tools evolve. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, and so let me, let me turn to Brian. Um, you were gonna tell us some about the details of the apps um, that are actually being put out, uh, both by Apple and Google and by others. Um, so why don't you uh, go ahead. Thanks, Brian. I'm going to just briefly explain contact tracing. Um, probably most of us are now familiar with that term, uh, but just in case, I want to give a brief introduction to it and then just quickly sketch the, the two major flavors of apps uh, that have um, emerged to assist with that, including the apps that would use the new Apple and Google API. So what's contact tracing? Uh, well, it's a public health technique that's been used uh, for a long time, dates back to smallpox uh, infections where it was first developed, um, but also more recently with Ebola uh, and some others. And in essence, it boils down to talking to people who have been diagnosed to figure out who they were in contact with while they were infectious, and then going back to those individuals to interview them to see if they've got signs or symptoms that would require testing uh, and or um, isolation and quarantine to help prevent the spread. And, and the theory behind it is fairly intuitive. Uh, in order to get ahead of the spread of a highly infectious disease, you need to trace back to where uh, the disease emerged and figure out where else, where the vectors are going and, and who might uh, be at risk. And, and so um, the four basic steps involved in it. First, you identify the existing cases, interview them, um, and find out who they were in contact with while they were infectious, go back to those people uh, and then work through that chain. And so it's uh, incredibly time intensive, uh, incredibly labor intensive, uh, and it's also uh, pretty privacy intrusive in its own right. Um, and uh, to Jen's point, uh, public health authorities uh, recognize uh, and have had some significant failures, especially in Africa during the Ebola outbreak, where uh, they would combine uh, contact tracing, manual contact tracing, with more intrusive or coercive measures like using police forces to enforce quarantine, uh, which would then undermine trust, and trust is critical uh, to manual contact tracing, and uh, as we'll talk about more, it's, it's critical to the apps uh, that might help. So how can applications help, or how do they purport to help? Um, well, as I just mentioned, contact tracing is extremely labor and time intensive, and so all the apps that have emerged connected to contact tracing are designed in some way to speed up and or make that process more efficient. Um, and uh, key is both getting to contacts quickly, uh, making sure we figure out who they are, um, and then also um, connected to that, one of, the, one of the reasons why contact tracing is effective is it allows scarce resources to be devoted more efficiently in containing the spread by quickly figuring out where the hotspots are uh, and allowing, for example, in, in the context of COVID-19, allowing limited testing capacity to be devoted uh, to the places where it's most likely to identify people who are also infected. Uh, and so the apps are essentially designed to make that process more efficient. There's, there's two basic versions that are out there with, with some, some details, lots, lots of important details actually um, with respect to the individual apps. But the basic difference, the, the, the basic categories are applications that use location data um, in the, the ones that have emerged in the U.S., it's primarily GPS, but in other countries, it's been sometimes GPS uh, along with cell tower data uh, and Wi-Fi hotspot data. Um, and these apps um, allow individuals to collect themselves their own location data, and then once they get diagnosed, to share that uh, as part of the contact tracing process. This allows um, the contact tracing process to be a little bit faster because rather than just relying on memory and prompting an individual by talking to them about what their patterns of movement generally are and where they actually might have been over let's say the last 14 days uh, they can just provide to the public health authority uh, essentially their their google maps data right everything everywhere they've been uh, during the relevant time period uh, and then that allows um, the public health authority and or the individual to think about oh well, you know you're your app is showing you were here, you didn't mention this, uh, you know, who are you in contact with there? So it, it speeds up that process. Uh, it also then uh, provides the, the capability, if a public health authority or other entity chooses to do it, to then 
uh, redact and anonymize that data and then create a map um, that over time can show uh, where infected individuals have been to identify hotspots. And then at least in theory, other users of the app or even the public could then look at that map and even without interacting directly with the public health authority, uh, ask themselves or identify for themselves if they're using the app, hey, I was in that location during the time when someone who's now been diagnosed uh, was there and therefore um, allows uh, individuals who even aren't directly involved in the contact tracing effort to self-identify as potential contacts and then get guidance from their doctor or public health authority as to whether to, to either get tested or uh, self-isolate uh, and do other things that, you know, that, that contact tracing itself is intended to do, but this, this expands it, as you can imagine. Um, the second version is uh, what Apple and Google have um, dubbed exposure notification to more clearly distinguish it from contact tracing itself. Uh, these are Bluetooth-based applications uh, that provide rotating anonymized identifiers uh, that um, have been described um, delightfully as chirping uh, while you're out. So if you have the app enabled, uh, your phone is chirping uh, at other, app, other individuals who are running the app and then transmitting and collecting um, other users of the app. And then if someone is diagnosed as positive for COVID-19 or another disease, then their anonymous IDs, their own anonymous IDs, as well as the ones uh, that they've been in contact with can be provided to a public health authority. And then notifications are pushed back out uh, to anyone um, who within that, that app system um, has been in contact with that person. And there's an algorithm that determines both how long you have to have been in contact and how close based on the Bluetooth signal strength. And this is uh, back to the accuracy point um, that Michelle mentioned. This, the, some of the, the devils in the details of how that works and how accurate it is. Um, and so um, those are the two major systems. Uh, what's the difference between the two of them? Well, they, um, they essentially trade off privacy and efficacy uh, in different ways. So the first one with location data, it's effective or at least it has a value add, even if there's only one user. If that user happens to be diagnosed with COVID-19, it, it will, at least in theory, make potentially more effective and more, more uh, quick the contact tracing effort with respect to that individual. And so it doesn't necessarily depend, although it works much better, if there are large numbers of users who have adopted it. Uh, the Bluetooth version, uh, but, but it's much less privacy protected for obvious reasons. Location data is much more sensitive in its own right, uh, and it's much more, um, much easier to re-identify someone based on even de-identified uh, location data. And that's part of the, the issues that have emerged in places like South Korea uh, that have been using um, these kinds of um, uh, apps and this kind of information in combination with a bunch of other things as well. Um, and then the the Bluetooth-based applications um, require mass adoption to work. The, it, if, if I'm the only one having a, an app downloaded and my, I'm the only one chirping, uh, you know, I'm like a lonely bird in the forest and no one's listening to my chirps and I'm not getting any chirps back and so uh, it's meaningless. And so you really need uh, mass adoption and one of the, one of the things that have been emerging in, in news accounts about the potential efficacy of these apps is there's really relatively low adoption rates even in uh, societies like Singapore that have high trust in government and relatively strong compliance with, with centralized mandates. Um, and even there, the, the adoption of these apps is relatively low. And so their, their efficacy is, is therefore uh, diminished. Uh, however, it's much more privacy protected because the only information that you're sharing uh, and receiving are these anonymized identifiers. It is possible to, to re-identify, and there are a number of uh, you know, well-recognized um, vulnerabilities, including you know, the ability to sort of take a, a Bluetooth antenna uh, and you know, run down a crowded area and, and collect these IDs and then re-identify, and, and then of course spoofing as well uh, is an issue. Uh, but it's much more privacy protected, but just much more uh, limited in what you can do uh, with the information. And so I'll, I'll stop there for now, but happy to go into more detail, uh, especially about, um, you know, Google and Apple just finalized uh, the API yesterday, I think, uh, and uh, finalized the restrictions that they're going to put on it. But we can talk more about that in the Q&A. Thanks, Brian. That's a super helpful uh, technical rundown of, of what's available.
Um, Stacy, uh, maybe you could tell us a little bit about the self-governance um, you know, measures as well as the public legislative measures that are being um, proposed uh, to deal with some of the privacy concerns that are coming up. Um, what, have you, what are you seeing um, on that front? Sure, thanks, Brian. And um, I'll just say I agree with basically everything that's been said, especially, Jen, your excellent points about uh, about trust and the fact that data collection is not at odds with public health efforts right now, and privacy is not at odds with public health efforts. In fact, privacy supports the public health, health efforts. Um, so a little bit about what companies are doing. Um, I think there are a few categories for me. First, there are many companies that are repurposing existing commercial data sets and software uh, to assist COVID-19 efforts to assist public health authorities. So a good example of this is uh, Salesforce working with New York City to provide the infrastructure uh, for manual contact tracers. Um, a lot of companies that collect public data too, so sort of your traditional data brokers, are able to help with manual contact tracing. For instance, if a contact tracer has incomplete data, needs to be able to distinguish John Smith from Virginia from John Smith from Maryland, right? Um, Second, um, I think for basically any large company, as a percentage of the workforce remains remote, as most of us are, um, employers are very interested in using remote monitoring tools, activity monitoring software, collaboration software tools like Zoom. All of this existed before the pandemic, but now there is more pressure and more scrutiny, which I think is overall a really good thing. Um, and finally, most companies with large workforces are considering how to use technology to ensure the safety of their own employees um, and their customers um, as people return to public spaces and shared spaces. So every large employer, I would say, is considering some combination of their own manual tracing through human resources, uh, mobile apps that would provide automated exposure notification, whether it's one of these location-based apps or something running off of the Google Apple API. Um, temperature screening, symptom tracking, and things like that. So in the United States, these are all issues that in-house privacy professionals are dealing with. Um, but privacy laws, legal privacy protections in the commercial sector are fairly limited. And, and particularly privacy protections in employment law are, are fairly limited. There are many employment laws related to discrimination. Um, but in a sense, for a lot of this, discrimination is also kind of the point, right? In the sense that you want to distinguish between people that have symptoms and people that don't, for example, so that you can effectively address the spread of the virus. Um, we have the Federal Trade Commission, we have the FTC Act, which at least requires a certain level of transparency around data collection um, and might prevent some abuses. Um, and we have the California Consumer Privacy Act, which is a baseline privacy law and has some protections, for instance, for deleting your data or opting out but doesn't really limit collection or use of data. So um, I would say US companies are really seeking guidance. Um, a lot of what they're doing, particularly global companies, is looking to the EU guidance that has come out from EU data protection authorities. And on that front, um, there has been a tremendous lot of, amount of guidance over the last couple of months around uh, how to provide the right transparency um, how to conduct data protection impact assessments. Uh, the fact that for anything COVID-19 related, a data protection impact assessment is going to be necessary uh, because you're typically talking about health data, which is a special sensitive category of data. Uh, and because you may also be talking about automated decision-making, which triggers additional uh, protections under EU law. Um, so, uh, all of this is very helpful, and some of the guidance has been really, really clear. So, for example, uh, the European Data Protection Board has said that in line with data minimization principles, in general, collecting precise location data history is not the right way to go if you can use Bluetooth instead. So, they've kind of put their thumb on the scale, I think, in the question between location-based apps and Bluetooth-based apps, although U.S. public health authorities, as, as you mentioned, uh, many of them are still interested in location data for, for many of the reasons you just said, Brian. Um, 
And it's possible that uh, this year we might see additional legal protections come, come out uh, federally. I haven't seen as much state legislation introduced on the privacy front, but there have been two big pieces of federal legislation introduced that would create legal rules for the collection and use of COVID-19 data. Um, the first uh, in May was by leading Senate Republicans on the Senate Commerce Committee, and the second, which was introduced last Thursday, was introduced by House and Senate Democrats. Um, so, you know, unsurprisingly, these are falling along a Republican and Democrat partisan lines, at least for now. <clears throat> and some of the big differences really echo the differences that we saw between Democratic and Republican proposals for comprehensive privacy legislation over the last couple of years. Um, and the bills are kind of similar in that respect, too, in that they're both uh, robust compliance regimes with strong protections for data, regardless of whether it's collected from a commercial entity, a nonprofit, a common carrier, and regardless of whether it's uh, collected from a, say, a health institution or an educational institution or any other sort of way you might break this down sectorally as we've traditionally done in the United States. Um, so I can speak more to those or, or maybe we'll get to some of it in, in the question and answer, but the, the basic commonalities between the Republican and Democrat proposals are that they have very strong data minimization requirements. Data collected for COVID-19 purposes can only be collected for that purpose and should be minimal and proportionate to meeting that purpose, which of course brings into question all of the things we've been discussing about accuracy and effectiveness. You know, if the data isn't going to be effective in meeting the public health goal, should not be collected. Step one. Um, the bills both have strong security requirements, accuracy requirements. They have to give you a method to correct your data if it's not accurate. Um, the Republican proposal requires recurring deletion, which is another best practice that would be kind of codified into law. Uh, and both of these proposals would require affirmative express consent from individuals prior to their data being collected for COVID-19 related purposes, um, which as we've talked about is a really important both privacy measure and enabler of public health efforts. Unfortunately, neither of these proposals is bipartisan yet. Um, and there are still some major differences that fall kind of along the lines that we saw, you know, with comprehensive privacy legislation related to, for example, enforcement, preemption, and the treatment of public data. And uh, finally, I think one of the one of the big differences that's going to be particularly fraught this year in, in coming to a consensus around legal protections is around the treatment of uh, data collection in the context of the employer-employee relationship. So collection of data from your employees would be governed and regulated very strictly under the democratic proposal introduced by Senators Blumenthal and Warner, uh, but would be exempted from the Republican counterpart um, introduced by Chairman Wicker. And that's gonna be a big deal for a few reasons. One, because I think the employment context is the locus of a lot of the privacy concerns that we're seeing, uh, but also because you're talking about introducing new federal compliance um, obligations while large companies are trying to come back online and get back to work and reopen the economy, which um, if the protections look streamlined and sharp and place uh, clear restrictions on use, that might be relatively easy to comply with. If it looks more like a complicated compliance regime with reporting requirements and opt-out mechanisms, that might be more difficult and require more time and effort and uh, resources to create. So stop there. That's the state of play, at least for now. Um, I should mention that uh, we may still see additional proposals coming out. I think there are other members of Congress that are interested in maybe a more targeted effort um, or a more narrow effort rather than a, a robust compliance regime, uh, but that remains to be seen. Wonderful. Thank you so much um, for running down that, that um, you know, the regulatory efforts um, around, around this COVID pri uh, privacy issue. Uh, so we have about a little over a half an hour left. Um, I'm going to start with some questions, but if the audience members, if you want to uh, queue up some Q&A, um, we will keep monitoring that and we will get to those questions eventually as well.
Um, what I wanted to return to, so I, I wanted to dig a little bit more into this cost benefit question because in part, uh, and I'll, I'll take each in turn, right? In part, the curiosity about these apps is that maybe they're effective, right? Maybe they're actually going to work. Uh, and so collecting this data is worth the game in, in some sense, right? So, but, uh, you know, Jen, you mentioned earlier that there's some doubts about this accuracy. Is this actually going to work? Um, there have been other questions raised about uh, geolocational data versus Bluetooth data, uh, whether one is actually better or not. Um, there's a lot, it seems to be a lot of uncertainty. We, on the one hand, we have the South Korean model, which seems to have been pretty effective um, and has also attracted some criticism about how much tracking that hap they had to, uh, to actually do. Uh, would that model work here in the American context? Um, is the European model different because we have, they have more trust in the government? That's been a, an issue that's been raised. Um, are there, is there some kind of American exceptionalism going on as well? Uh, can, so maybe I, I can throw this out to the panel to, to talk first on the benefit side. What is the benefit of collecting all this data? Does it even actually work? How much uncertainty uh, is there around, around some of that uh, technology? And then I'll, I'll switch over to the cost side, of course. Yeah, Brian? So just to jump in real quickly, um, so we've got, we've got to figure out, if we're, to reopen, we've got to figure out how we're going to identify emerging hotspots quickly. And, and that, that's just the reality. I mean, if we, could, if we could efficiently and effectively test everyone, you know, daily, um, then we wouldn't need to collect data beyond that. And we could, you know, we could, we could work this out quickly. We don't have the, the capability, the tests aren't that good. Um, and so we're not gonna be able to do that. So we need to, we need to figure out a way to prioritize testing and figure out how to get ahead of emerging hotspots to keep the curve lowered. And so the apps, at least in theory, um, magnify the effectiveness and the speed with which you can do that, you, know, you, you can do that effort. Um, and then, you know, there's, there's real questions. So you, you raised South Korea. I think I was trying to pull it up, but my, my recollection is that the South Korean app that's sort of the equivalent of the ones that I mentioned actually doesn't have that high of an adoption rate. And it's really all the other things that South Korea has done um, that are you know relatively intrusive. They collect, they've got an emergency law that allows them to collect directly cell phone data. Uh, you know, they've got an incredibly extensive um, regime in place to enforce quarantine. So it's, it's really all those other mes measures. And then it, there's some, there, I think there's some question as to whether the contact tracing app itself, how effective it is. And you know, that's one of the important issues or concerns that's been raised here is, as, as between putting a lot of time and energy into these contact tracing apps, the ones that, that do what I described, wouldn't it be much better to put time into this, the Salesforce type apps that just allow um, public health authorities to manage the data that they're getting now better, right? And, and there's huge issues around interoperability and compatibility and, and lots of gaps there, lots of gaps in defining what a, what a diagnosis is. Uh, so there, you know, there are those broader trade-offs. Um, the argument, I think, from the Apple Google side is, hey, look, from a privacy perspective, we're, we're, we've locked this down in <laughs> to a degree that no other app on the, on the, in the app store is locked now. And so um, no harm, no foul. And, and they've done it precisely for the reason that Jen and Stacy emphasized, which is if there's not trust in these things, no one's going to adopt them and they only work if lots of people adopt them. So, you know, many of us download apps all the time and then, you know, willingly share data to do things uh, like find a good restaurant or uh, a better route to work. You know why? You know I think the perspective is why wouldn't we? Um, you know why wouldn't we down one load one of these to help that response? And the re hard reality is it doesn't look like we're willing to do that. So um, it, it, you know it's it, it is a you know it's an interesting and it, there aren't good answers there. Yeah, Michelle and then Jen. Yeah, um, I know that's not a direct quote, but I will say you know no harm no foul is not a very holistic way to analyze the situation, right? People are going to rely on these apps as though they are a real proxy for whether they've come into contact with someone who's sick, right? Um, that is how they are being sold. That's um, how they're described in the app store. Some of them are probably going to get in trouble for deceptive practices, right? 
because that's not what they tell you. Um, not in any stretch of the imagination. Um, we have some problems here with um, one, right? There are a lot of people out there who are asymptomatic. So even if they are um, out and using these apps, they are never going to get the test and triggered the system to notify other people, right? Um, there are people that are going to come in contact with others, but they'll be wearing masks or maybe there'll be a wall or a car window. So there's not actually going to be the transmission, right? Um, so there's going to be a lot of false positives and false negatives in the system. So it's not going to be reliable, right? And we're asking people to forego working sometimes, right? Um, which is very serious. Um, people are unable to pay their rent or buy groceries at this point, right? We have people sitting in eight hour lines in food banks. So very serious um, consequences for getting this wrong. Um, it, it's hard. I, I don't think it's um, trivial, but um, it's much more serious than, well, maybe the data might help someone. It really needs to be something that we can give people some assurance on. Uh, and I know this is sort of one little piece in the bigger system, but um, we know where our safety net is failing, right? If all of this is supposed to lead to people being eligible to self-quarantine, that means we need people to be able to work remotely, school their children remotely, get food remotely. And that's really where I think tech could step up because we're not finding solutions right now, right? This is the long-term way to deal with it is to let people live at home safely. And um, I would love to see all of that powerful American ingenuity turn to that next. Jen, did you have a comment that you wanted to add? Yeah, um, I, you know, as you mentioned, Brian, South Korea is a country that has launched a massive testing and contact tracing program um, and officials uh, seek to anonymize and publish people's location histories in the effort to stem COVID-19. But because it's just proven really difficult to truly anonymize location data, a problem that has emerged that many people have become more afraid of having their identities, their associations, and where they go, whether it's a love motel, a gay bar, or a religious institution revealed over having the virus itself. And folks being more afraid of stigma and social humiliation over the disease itself can interfere with testing, which folks have mentioned um, is arguably the most important interven intervention to control the virus. And this is another example of how privacy invasive tools threaten both our civil liberties and public health. So in terms of contact tracing's effectiveness, it should only be deployed if it promises to be effective. And continue to be used only if it's shown to work, but at this time, there's not sufficient information to definitively conclude that the proposed tools, whether it's by Google, Apple, or other companies, will definitely be effective. Um, we're not sure if it'll be a good use of resources or if it will prove to be practical in real world situations. Um, because as I said earlier, uh, every tech assisted contact tracing tool is predicated on the assumption that there will be adequate and equitable testing and treatment resources available. It's also unclear at this point what benchmarks public health agencies will use to measure effectiveness and whether it is appropriate for a contact tracing tool to be part of a broader COVID-19 public health strategy. The last thing we need right now is technology being improperly relied on and wasting health resources or creating more confusion. And to prevent improper reliance on contact tracing or related technologies, health agencies should set clear public benchmarks for what standards a tool must meet to be considered effective. There need to be auditing standards to ensure that as the COVID-19 situation evolves, um, the tool will continue to be effective because you know, we're getting new information about the pathology of the disease day by day. Um, and I, I also wanted to lift up something Michelle mentioned um, about voluntariness and the importance of, of, of trust. Um, this is something I think everyone has mentioned here, but contact tracing apps won't really be effective if infected individuals are not uh, willing to supplement the data collected with their personal knowledge. As Michelle mentioned, um, even if widely used contact tracing apps uh, won't, um, won't be adequate because uh, folks may need to provide additional information, you know, if they were in a different apartment. So, and, and uh, a notification that they may have been exposed is wrong. They might want to 
uh, supply that information to make sure that notifications are actually accurate. And the Apple and Google proposal, which uses Bluetooth proximity to alert individuals whether or not they may have been near someone infected with COVID-19, has uh, a few blind spots because, you know, it might not detect when an individual is in a different apartment um, or in a car um, or, or there's uh, or they've interacted with someone, but uh, with some plexiglass between them or some sort of other protective gear. So it's really critical to making sure that any use of tools are voluntary in order to build public trust in the tool. And um, we need to be continuously thinking about civil liberties concerns as we evaluate these tools. Yeah, so um, that's very, so it's true, right? So no tool can be a complete replacement for uh, the traditional proven techniques. Um, one, but one thing that um, maybe the audience members are, are sharing this question um, is, you know, there's been a lot of talk about the need for voluntariness or the idea that maybe uh, citizens won't be willing to download these apps or to use them. And so the, the natural question might be, well, why not uh, force people to use it, right? Uh, make it like the YouTube album. It just auto downloads onto your phone and now you're stuck with it and you don't have a choice as to whether or not you're going to use it, right? And in some ways, Brian, your question about this was, uh, what your response was, South Korea just does this. They just collect this data and you don't have a choice about this. Um, and Stacey, your, your comments, your initial comments, you mentioned that the EU has gone the other direction, right? That you actually uh, have to opt in, that you have to have affirmative express consent prior to collection. And that seems to be intention with this idea that there has to be broad adoption, broad participation. Um, and so just this idea of, and maybe this is a, a, you know, a, such a basic question, but if it really is important for people to participate, why not make it mandatory? Wouldn't that increase the effectiveness of these kinds of tools? So I saw uh, Brian and then Michelle. So, so just real, real quick to, to clarify, the, the South Korea has a, a wide array of, of tools that they're using and the app that's the equivalent of these is voluntary. Um, it's just that they can collect other data uh, in other ways um, without, uh, through, the, through the emergency law. Uh, Israel is similar. They have an app that's voluntary, but then uh, they've been using, um, they, they've been using the um, intelligence forces to, you know, to use tools that they were using otherwise uh, to collect data. And, and so that's, you know, that's mandatory in that sense. But, um, just, just to, and, and so I, yes, I, but but that would just that's untenable uh, that that we would mandate the use of this. Now, where it becomes much more challenging is as uh, Michelle, Jen, and Stacy re referenced. How, you know, how voluntary is it if uh, to take the higher ed situation where I'm at? I I have to use some kind of uh, application, whether it's a symptom checker, as I've heard some schools. Um, uh, discuss or something like one of these apps to be able to attend live class versus only be on Zoom, uh, or you know even even more controversial to come to work uh, and get paid, right? And that's you know those are where we're going to have really you know really tough discussions. Um, I just want to address a couple of things that, that Jen said. the The efficacy issue is is really really important because obviously if these apps don't work and there's real issues with the Bluetooth. Uh, especially although the GPS as well, then then that just undermines trust and it, and and it makes it pointless. And this is where it's it's really interesting to me that the location based data has sorry my dog's starting to bark has has value from person one. And, and the the question is whether that value is sufficient enough for the much higher privacy risks that it poses. Um, and I, I I hadn't paid attention, Stacy, to the fact that that the EU have come down in favor definitively of Bluetooth um, based on data minimization principles. Because uh, it's interesting, I, I, I think that's, that's up, for, <laughs> up for analysis in the sense that public health authorities, contact tracing is about location data. That in, in the sense that you are identifying where a person has been and we're doing it manually. And what the apps do is they layer in an automated process. And most of them are trying to do it in a privacy protective way. Now, I don't know enough about the public health side to know whether uh, the app is, is that much more valuable so that that privacy trade-off is worth it. But I, to my mind, it's still something that's worth analyzing and, and letting those, you know, those experts weigh in on. Uh, whereas the consensus seems to have landed on 
if we're going to use a contact tracing app, we, we ought to only use Bluetooth. And, and that's just really surprising to me as I learn more about how these things work. Yeah, Michelle? Yeah, and I just want to remind people that um, protesters stormed U.S. capitals with machine guns in the last couple of weeks because someone asked them to wear a mask on their face. You know, like the idea that we're going to force these onto people's phones, it's, just, it's never going to happen. It would not be tolerated. Um, and that is foreseeable. This is the other funny thing about this is um, maybe there is a misunderstanding with some of the folks who are developing some of these apps. Um, people, the trust was not there. It had been broken over the last few years. This should not be surprising to anyone that there's going to be a problem with adoption, right? Um, and so that should have been thought of months ago when people started committing to this um, and trying to understand better um, what did what do people and epidemiologists need, right? What do they want, what are they willing to do? How do you design to actual human beings in real world situations? Um, it just makes you wonder whether that actually was done in this situation. But I would also say, you know, you don't want too much data. Um, that is one hallmark of what we saw in the post 9-11 collection programs, right? Whether it was digital or physical. Um, it was too much, it was junk, it was obscuring real information to the extent there are actually terrorists found here. Their data was in those giant hay piles and it was never acted upon because there was just too much, right? So um, there is always a risk in too much surveillance, collecting too much irrelevant data and not allowing experts to really track down where um, they need to find um, the illness or the bad guys or the terrorists. Right. But I would also say, I think it is a little more complicated, even being a privacy person, about what we do about work in schools. Right. Because if you look now, workplaces have an obligation to keep people safe and healthy under OSHA and other laws. Right. And those include things like keeping information about people who get sick. I don't know if we want to actually overturn those laws. They were written for a reason. I'm not a workplace uh, safety expert. Right. But I think we need to realize it's a little more complicated and sophisticated. What we want is to make sure that um, employers don't later discriminate, right? Change different health insurance rates, um, maybe process data in ways to decide who to bring back um, off of like a furlough or something like that, right? There are ways that we don't want being ill to be um, the basis of discrimination, but there are still obligations on both schools and employers to keep people safe and healthy to the best of their ability. And that's where, um, again, legislation would be great, it is stuck in a lot of political debates and we're going to need to find a much more sophisticated and balanced solution, I think, that is gonna be able to actually protect workers, students, and everyday consumers who are just using cell phones. Yeah, so, so I've been, you know, obviously dra uh, dramatizing this a little bit. Um, and I know some of the comments for both from you, Michelle, and also from you, Jen, um, have tried to say, this isn't quite that stark of a trade-off between you know, the benefits and the costs, that there is actually a harmony that you can um, have the public health and balance the privacy concerns. And so, you know, what are some of the ways that we can, um, you know, data minimization has been, has been mentioned several times. Uh, what are some of the ways that um, we can sort of minimize the privacy costs um, while still achieving some of the, uh, the public health benefits? Um, you know, what are the governance mechanisms? Uh, so, so maybe some of that, is that possible? Is that, or, you know, not just, is it theoretically possible, but what are the steps that uh, we should be taking, uh, you know, both sort of in terms of process, uh, in terms of um, governance um, that, that would be most effective in that, in that direction? Yep, Brian. That's the hardest question. <laughs> um, I, it's, so what, what's, I'm not going to answer your question directly. I'm going to, I'm going to make a different, make a related point. What, what's encouraging about the conversation, at least in, and, and, you know, part of this may be my own bubble. Uh, but I think I'm talking to enough people outside my bubble about this, but what's encouraging is, is we, the conversation seems voluntarily to have incorporated as a key priority these privacy issues. And uh, as Stacy emphasized, uh, you know, there, there are still, even CCPA notwithstanding, uh, relatively thin, if any, um, 
privacy obligations that are legally mandated on employers uh, and in the private sector. And yet the conversation has um, incorporated privacy to a degree that I think would have been incredibly, incredibly surprising five years ago. And so I think that's encouraging in the sense that we're, we finally reached a point as a society where we're embracing this obligation as a, as a policy matter, even where it's not legally mandated. Now, we don't yet know what it's going to look like when we really reopen and, and whether, you know, and to what extent employers are just going to, you know, do what they feel they need to do uh, and, and run roughshod over these or not. Uh, so it's, it's too early to tell, but it's at least encouraging that it's, it's in the mix. And I've heard from a number of uh, privacy professionals that, that have said, you know, hey, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm fielding so many calls now about, ex about how to reopen. I'm, I'm, you know, in the middle or, at the, at, you know, in the lead of the conversation uh, and people are consulting me. And so I think that's encouraging. I, I don't know that there are good answers, but at least every, you know, at least at a principal level, there seems to be broad agreement to start that we ought to be doing all these things that, that Jen nicely summarized in the beginning uh, and that Michelle amplified on. And so whether it plays out that way, I don't know. Uh, but at least for now, there's, it, it does seem to be part of uh, an explicit part of the conversation in a way that's encouraging. Yeah, Jen? Um, you know, Brian, I, I think you asked a really good question. And um, I just want to emphasize again that privacy is compatible with public health. Um, and when I say that, um, we need to be thinking about uh, what is actually necessary to collect in terms of data in order to effectively uh, battle COVID-19, but also protect our privacy. And, and those things can happen, um, but, but a few things need to be in place in order for that to actually occur. So at a minimum, if a contact tracing app where technology is used, state and local governments and companies should adopt strict policies and procedures that ensure the tool is effective um, and that there are evaluations and benchmarks set for uh, the efficacy of the technology, factoring things like accuracy, the risks of false positives and negatives, and other known limitations. Um, governments should also ensure that the tool is voluntary. Again, um, you know, I, I really liked what Brian said earlier, emphasizing, you know, what does voluntariness really mean if um, access to public accommodations, employment, um, and other necessities and critical services are conditioned upon uh, use of a contact tracing tool, it's not truly voluntary, it's coercive. So that should be kept in mind. Um, something that's really important to ensure that this balance is struck is to, is to limit the use of any tool for a very specific purpose. So governments should require that any data obtained from these sort of tools can only be used by specific uh, specific persons, specific agencies, and for predefined and specific purposes related to the pandemic. And these should not be overbroad. It should be specifically limited to we're just using this for contact tracing purposes. Um, and, and there should be set standards to destroy after um, the, uh, any effective use of the, of the data expires. There also need to be clear terms of service that provides strong, enforceable privacy protections. Technology developers should commit to providing such protections and distributors of technology like Apple and Google should limit their distribution to technology that is accompanied by these protections. And lastly, again, the technology needs to be auditable. Um, and this is so important uh, to ensure that there's transparency and public oversight, along with accountability, which ties into that enforcement piece. Governments should adopt independent auditing and oversight measures to ensure that any contact tracing app is, is limited to the predefined specific public health purpose. It's actually operating as intended and is effective and is limited, and is limited to the duration of the pandemic. And in order to ensure that use of the tool will actually be limited to the duration of the pandemic, there need to be predefined criteria of when to call it, uh, when, when, to, when to declare victory and say, we've used the tool and it's been effective, but it's no longer effective. That needs to be decided beforehand so that um, use of the tool doesn't outlive uh, this crisis.
So um, we have a few minutes left. Um, let me turn it over to the uh, audience questions. And there are actually two that came in that were uh, very closely uh, you know, overlapping. Um, one is, who would be responsible for the second wave if we hesitate to use contact tracing due to privacy concerns? Um, and the other question is, what would you say to someone who says, right now we're in unprecedented territory, now is just not the time to care about privacy when people are dying? Right? These are very similar questions, just this idea that maybe privacy is a luxury and we don't have that luxury in this time of emergency. Well, you know, I, I would say that um, people say that in every situation, right? Whether it's investigating terrorism or law enforcement, um, it's really just sort of old hat at this point. Um, the, the reality is, is that we actually process data constantly, literally thousands of companies and millions and millions of developers every day. We are writing, you know, 30 years of innovation. And so we aren't actually starting from scratch. We have a lot to draw on. And um, honestly, even if we look at our little bubble now, we had three or four months, right, to decide um, how we wanted to, at least in this country, use data. So it really isn't all or nothing. Um, we aren't starting from scratch, and um, there are already things that we know um, help protect privacy and, you know, still allow companies or governments to process data in ways that serve people. But again, that fully accepts that the more data you have, the more sickness you're going to find, and the more you're going to be able to treat people and make them well. Literally nothing in that chain of events is true. Right, we have no, we don't, or it could be, but we don't have any information on it. So I would say anybody who's jumping all the way to the end needs to go back and start thinking about, really, is that how this is going to work? What evidence do we have? Um, if we want it to work that way, fine, then how do we make it so? Um, but those things are not just, you know, objective states of uh, data collection and use right now, and um, we shouldn't treat them as such. I wanted to actually um, fit in one more question, uh, but I see your hand, Brian. Um, so you can choose to respond to either one. But the other uh, set of questions that came in was about the disparity, right? Um, so one, uh, both on income, but also on racial or ethno, uh, ethnic um, uh, lines. So one was, we should also consider that there's a huge racial disparity in the number of deaths from coronavirus. And the other was that not everyone has a smartphone um, and so should there be some way of providing smartphones or some way of providing devices um, as a way of expanding uh, if that's necessary, right? If this is an, a, a, you know, the direction that we want to go in. But both of those questions, I think, go at this idea of, um, of that, that this is not a, uh, um, this is affecting different people in different ways. Yeah, so, Brian, so, you want to so on, on that point, that, that's part of the argument that these apps are a distraction uh, and, and are, are sort of, occupying an undue amount of resources is that, you know, they're, they're for people who, they're only effective for people who have, the, in fact, the latest or one of the latest smartphones that can have the latest uh, iOS update. And so I, that, you know, that is a legitimate point. Uh, and, and it's, you know, part of that, and that broader analysis that most, you know, that many impact assessments in, include is, it, you know, should we spend money here or there? The argument that I've heard in favor of them is, well, it, it makes manual contact tracing more efficient and therefore could allow in a, in a coordinated effort to devote more of those time labor intensive resources to uh, more marginalized communities that are not, um, you know, that don't have access to this tool. I, I don't, I'm not sure, I, I don't have a good sense as to, you know, how that plays out. Um, to, to just circle back to the, to the earlier question briefly, uh, as, as Jen emphasized at the beginning, all of these efforts because they deal with an incredibly sensitive issue where we know there's stigma from just being infected with COVID-19. So privacy is, is integral to effective response. They are not at all at odds. Where it gets interesting to me is assuming we, we, assuming we trust public health authorities or that we accept that public health authorities need to be trusted to do their jobs in dealing with this very sensitive um, sets of issues around identifying who has been infected and who else is at risk and whether or not uh, potential people at risk are complying with things like quarantine recommendations. Um, I, 
if we start from there, I think that that puts at least a slightly different lens on the trade-offs we're willing uh, to make around uh, what data we collect, whether it's through automated applications or otherwise. It, it still requires all of those very good practices to be in place uh, because that trust is predicated on it. Uh, but I, it, it, it's some of the conversation, it strikes me as preempting the ability of a, of a at least a theoretically trusted entity like a public health authority to do the right thing with data. Uh, and we need to be able to trust them to do the right thing with information or, or we won't have manual contact tracing. So that, that's the conundrum that runs through my mind as I think about these things. Stacey, do you have a, something to add? Yeah, I, I, I just, um, I agree we're going to have efficacy issues regardless of the technology used and every entity that I've run across is interested in using many, many different types of uh, technologies and different types of data collection to address this. So I think we're going to be living in some period of uncertainty for a long time on this and that's an uncomfortable place to be. Um, just to use the Apple Google API as an example, um, I, I think one thing many are not appreciating is that the existence of this new API um, or method for uh, apps to get data off of the phone exists as a reaction to the limitations of location data and uh, those are are a result of the privacy protections that have been baked into the operating systems for a long time to prevent our phones from becoming surveillance devices. Um, one example of that, for example, is that when an app asks you for location, it has limitations on what it can access when it's running in the background on your phone. When you don't have that app open in front of you, when it's running in the background, it is limited in how much location data it can get and uh, the, um, the, the ability to passively scan for Bluetooth signals and the ability to passively emit Bluetooth signals. Um, and if it didn't have that limitations, uh, that limitation, I think we saw from experience over the last five, 10 years, what was happening was apps were using Bluetooth, using Wi-Fi networks to reverse engineer location and avoid operating system settings to invade privacy. Um, so those operating systems protections were sort of built in and operated as a check on how useful location data and apps in general were ever gonna be to combat COVID-19. Um, and you have limitations no matter what. So even highly, highly precise uh, geolocation data, latitude, longitude with timestamp, it's still not gonna tell you if I'm standing a foot away from somebody between a wall. Um, proximity, the kind of proximity information that Apple and Google have made available um, under really tight uh, restrictions um, is one way, I think, to solve for some of that under the direction of public health authorities. Um, but it's probably not going to be perfect. They had to, they had to balance uh, factors there in, in terms of what they were going to make available uh, without it becoming too privacy invasive. So on balance, I think it's better than doing nothing. Um, but we're, we're going to have questions about all of these technologies for a long time. So we're almost at time and I have to wrap up the panel, although I, I could talk about this all day. Um, I would like to give the panelists an opportunity just to um, either uh, if they have closing thoughts or a pointers to resources for further reading, um, any, other, um, any other messages you want to send our audience? Uh, um, who, uh, who, who, I could, I, John, would you like to start? Yeah, thank you, Brian. Um, I would just really like to lift up that a purely technical solution will not be the answer to this pandemic. And I am so glad that you mentioned race and equity issues because data on the COVID-19 outbreak has shown that black and brown communities have been disproportionately impacted with the highest death rates and uh, with the greatest numbers of those impacted. And any solution, technical or otherwise, that does not specifically ensure that these communities will be helped will exacerbate racial disparities after COVID-19 is long gone. So it's, it's really important that not only communities of color are supported, um, but also low-income folks. We know that 
many low income and elderly folks don't actually have access to smartphones, as you pointed out as well. So there are lots of equity issues involved with the deployment of any technology, not just in the context of uh, COVID-19, but in just the context of our society. So if we don't bring an equity, civil liberties and privacy framework to how we're thinking about deploying uh, very privacy invasive tools in a public health context, we will no doubt exacerbate existing uh, societal inequities. Maybe I can throw it to you, Michelle. Um, just that, uh, you know, we'll keep talking about this. Um, you can visit us at cdt.org. We're trying to think holistically about how this is affecting students, you know, consumers, patients. And um, there's a role for data here. There really is. Um, and we really need to avoid accepting this whole framing that more data is better, less is bad. Um, and there's a magic cure in the information there. Um, it's really only as green, as helpful as, you know, as smart as we are when we choose to use it. Great. Brian, any closing thoughts? Sure, I, I agree. We're, we're only just starting this conversation and uh, things are moving incredibly quickly. Um, th there's definitely a role for data, as Michelle said, but, um, you know, as, as Jen uh, accurately you know, warned, we, there, there, there's an urge to reach for technical tools um, and, and allow the, you know, the technology to drive the solutions uh, that we need to be wary about. And so um, I, I, I fall on the side that I think that, that the data can be useful, but um, I think we need to let the public health authorities you know, dictate that uh, more. And so look forward to hopefully having a future conversation when, we, when we've seen what um, employers, schools, and others are doing uh, with different technologies and, um, and other solutions to get things reopened and, and work through some of these hard issues. But I, as I said before, I think it's really encouraging that privacy seems to be embedded into the discussion in ways that might not have been um, five years ago. Great, and then Stacy, and then before I turn it to, over to Dennis, yeah, Stacy, final word. I, I think it's encouraging too, uh, to, to Brian's point, and I agree there, I think there is a role for technology here and a role for data collection. One of the things I find kind of ironic about the current federal legislation debate is that we're considering stricter obligations on companies and other entities processing COVID-19 data than for anyone else, which is, is almost the opposite of what you might expect for a very clear public health good. You would, you would want to use data. You would want some amount of flexibility or ability to use data under the right kinds of uh, data protection rules and safeguards, um, and you would maybe want stricter obligations for other non-public health or non-scientific, non-research related data collection and processing. Um, so that is interesting, but it's still, I think, optimistic in terms of sort of laying the, the pavement for possible future broad baseline privacy legislation. And the single most important thing to that, I think, is the principle of purpose limitation. If we took one paragraph of the federal legal proposals that just said, if you process data for COVID-19 purposes, you may not use it to serve ads, send to law enforcement, reuse for immigration enforcement, and anything else that you might secondarily use the data for down the road, that by itself would do a tremendous amount to, to, to both uh, sort of clean up data processing in the United States, but also engender trust. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Um, data minimization, collection minimization, as well as purpose limitations, yeah. Okay, um, I have to close the panel, so I'll turn it back over to you, Dennis. Um, go ahead. Okay, first of all, uh, uh, fellow audience members, please join me in uh, thanking our speakers and our moderator for a really informative and interesting um, workshop and, and session today. Um, I'd also like to thank you, uh, our audience members. This is the first time that we have done a webinar like this. Circumstances have forced it on us, uh, but thank you for, for, uh, for, do, for, for joining us in this and uh, helping to make it a success. We hope that it's been interesting and informative for you. And we intend these events you know, to be conversation starters. We've raised, the speakers raised a, a, a number of issues and we saw some differences, differences of opinion and hopefully you have your own opinions about some of these things. So we encourage you to take you know, what you've heard here, take it back to your families and your friends and your neighbors and continue this conversation so we can all think better as, as a society about 
these issues. Um, thanks for joining us and please look for future data points events um, all on, on issues of uh, data and society. So thanks again to our speakers and thanks to all of you. Uh, stay safe. Thanks.